Hi, this is your host, Sandeep Bharti, and welcome to TFR Daily News. We are starting a new show where we'll give you la latest stories, latest news from this week and past week. Since it's going to be a daily show, so we will not be covering past week's stories. But since this is the first episode of the show, we are covering some of the biggest stories from last week and this week. We are trying to make it regular, but we are sticking with five stories per day. The stories will be provided in both audio and video format. We will be releasing it as a podcast and we'll also be publishing it in text format so let's see how it goes whatever you think please share your thoughts in the comments below so without further ado let's get started red hat has announced the release of red hat enterprise linux 7.7 .7 beta is the last update in the full support phase of rel 7 branch key updates of this release include support for latest generation of enterprise hardware as well as remediation of recently disclosed micro architectural data sampling or zombie load vulnerability that were affecting Linux systems. RHEL 7 was released way back in 2014 and full support is offered for five years, which includes all new features and software functionalities. After that, it moves into the maintenance phase where users continue to get critical and important security advisories, but they won't receive any new software functionalities. Maintenance releases are supported for another five years. And after that, there are two years of extended support, which means that in a nutshell, RHEL users get up to 12 years of support. While most Red Hat customers are running RHEL 7, RHEL 8 is already out, which is optimized for cloud native workload. Red Hat offers a very smooth upgrade path from one major release to the next, but most users run a very complex workload and stay on existing release till the end of life. It takes a lot of planning to move from one release to other. So the 10 years gives you enough time. So everybody who is running RHEL 7 won't be jumping on RHEL 8 anytime soon. That was the first release. The second announcement is, and this is a big one, Apple is joining open source organizer CNCF. Those who don't know, CNCF stands for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It is part of Linux Foundation. I don't know how many of you know, but Apple is one of the biggest users of open source projects. For example, Siri, you know, everybody knows Siri, Apple's virtual assistant. It is powered by Apache Mesos project. And there are so many other projects that Apple heavily uses. And like any other open source user, Apple also contributes to these open source projects. That is how the ecosystem works. Because it's simple, if you're using any open source con uh, project, you will come across bugs, you will need some features and functionalities, you will like to improve the code. And the only way to do that is by contributing back to the project. If you are not doing that, then you are creating a lot of technical debt. So in two years, you will have a lot of code base that you made changes to, but you never pushed back to the upstream community. So you have literally created a fork. And now you are investing a lot of engineering resources in maintaining that fork. So what is the point of using open source in the first place? The point was to cut on R&D and all the investment that you make in software development so you can focus on the core applications that actually kind of differentiates you from your, 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 your competitors. So no company does that and Apple also doesn't do that. They do most of the work in upstream. So they have been uh, using a lot of open source. They have been contributing to a lot of open source projects. but. They don't talk about, well, in general, Apple doesn't like to talk about. The first time I saw Apple booth at any open source conference was at KubeCon in Seattle last year. I actually went there and got a mug also uh, from Apple, just as a souvenir. This is the Apple mug that I got from KubeCon Seattle last year. Uh, and now Apple is officially joining the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as a, as a top label platinum end user member, which means that Apple will join another 87 existing CNCF end user members like Adidas, Elder Assassin, Box, GitHub, New York Times, Reddit, Spotify, Walmart, and so many other players. Um, as part of Apple's um, uh, membership, uh, Tom Duran, he's a senior engineering manager at Apple, he will be joining CNCF's governing board. But there is a difference uh, how CNCF works. So they have a governing board and every project have their own technical committees. Governing boards decide the high level where to invest, what projects are interested. They don't have any influence whatsoever over the actual code base. Technical committees which are decided by the project itself, they make all the decisions. So there is a lot of FUD that you will see around that, hey, Microsoft is joining the Linux Foundation or CNCF. That means they will have a lot of influence on the project. That is not true. Uh, they have a very clear separation of 
uh, these two, you know, bodies, the governing body and the technical body. So uh, commercial vendors have no influence whatsoever. And the only way you can have influence in open source is by uh, allocating more developers uh, towards the project. And, and that's how it works. The more developers you have, the more influence you will have. And that's why some of the companies, you know, uh, and then also, you know, if you're, if you're a heavy user, you will allocate more developer resources. And that is a normal practice it's called meritocracy. It's simple. So I think that's good news that Apple is finally coming out uh, and joining these open source foundations. Since we are talking about cloud, the, the most interesting story was Microsoft and Oracle are teaming up to take on Amazon Web Services or AWS. Uh, if you look at the public cloud world, there are only two camps, AWS and non-AWS, period. Uh, AWS dominates the public cloud space with huge margin. No one else comes close, not even Google, Microsoft, or Oracle. But now, uh, Microsoft and Oracle are joining forces to make their offerings more compelling for users so they can move away from uh, AWS. Uh, the partnership between Oracle and Microsoft creates kind of interoperability between the clouds of these two companies. Oracle has Oracle Cloud and, you know, Microsoft has Azure. So what will happen is that it will allow customers to migrate and run mission critical enterprise workload across Microsoft Azure and Oracle Cloud. It won't matter which cloud you use or which application or service you use. You can pick and choose the best cloud for your workload. Uh, there are a lot of areas where Microsoft excels and there are a lot of areas where Oracle excels and now enterprise customers will be able to connect Azure services like analytics and AI to Oracle Cloud and access services like autonomous database. Uh, one of the key components of this partnership is direct and super fast network between the two clouds. So users won't experience any latency whatsoever when they are running mission critical application and that is really important. What it means is that customers can then whichever workload make more sense on whichever cloud, whether it be Azure or Oracle Cloud. Another thing is they're offering single sign-in, which will help users in, in you know, better user provisioning and the source management across Azure and Oracle. You don't have to have two different separate login systems for your organization, just one single sign-in. That's amazing. One of the biggest advantages that customer will see is also in support. Uh, these two companies are offering a collaborative support model, which will allow uh, customers to use the existing customer support relationship and process with either of the two companies without worrying about whose customers they are. Uh, what it simply shows is that uh, the cloud war is just starting, it's just heating up and we'll see more such partnership in future to dethrone de uh, AWS from the Iron Throne. Now, the last story of the day is a bit interesting and that is that CERN is looking at Microsoft alternatives. I mean, CERN is the home to the internet and Higgs boson and they're doing a lot of scientific work out there. Uh, and as we all know, we have published a lot of interviews with CERN that they heavily use open source software. Open source is actually at the heart of all the scientific work that CERN is doing. They use technologies like OpenStack and Kubernetes. However, when it comes to user facing applications, which could be a desktop, which could be a mail client, which could be um, like conferencing services, they rely on Microsoft technologies such as Windows, Skype, Mail, and what so on there are Microsoft literally dominates the desktop world. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons uh, CERN was using Microsoft product, okay, you have to also understand that CERN as an organization has thousands of not only employees as staffers, they have a lot of research people, they come from different companies and different organizations who work on all the projects that CERN is doing, which means they have thousands of those client machines and client accounts. Uh, that could be very expensive if you're going for a regular license. What Microsoft did was they offered a discount uh, to CERN because CERN had a you know, uh, status of academic institution. Uh, and th this kind of you know, uh, status brings the cost down. It's not per user, uh, which allows CERN to use Microsoft technologies across the organization. And then CERN has been using Microsoft technologies for over 20 years now under the discount rate. But for some unknown reason, Microsoft decided to revoke CERN's academic status, which means that Microsoft now wants CERN to pay for each user running their software. That will increase the cost 
by many Ford. An organization like CERN cannot afford that. So CERN has been looking at alternatives of Microsoft technologies and they actually started a project called Microsoft Alternative or MALT. Uh, the goal is to put CERN back in control of their software stack using open source technologies. On their blog post, CERN has listed the core principles of MART, which is deliver the same service to every category of CERN personnel, avoid vendor lock-in to decrease, avoid vendor lock-in, deliver the same service to every category of CERN personnel, avoid vendor lock-in to decrease risk and dependency on companies like Microsoft, keep hands on the data and address the common use cases. Uh, CERN is already piloting some alternatives to, to products and services like Mail and Skype. I see two potential outcomes of this move. Either Microsoft will restore CERN's academic status under all the pressure that is mounting here, especially in the press, or CERN will manage to become independent of Microsoft technologies. I mean, there are already many European organizations that are working on projects that help them move towards vendor neutral open source technologies. Uh, what is interesting is, and this is something tricky also, that while CERN finds it easy to find the Higgs boson using open source technologies, desktop centric solutions or user facing solutions are a bit complicated. I feel that this is going to be as challenging for CERN uh, to find alternatives to Microsoft technologies as it is to find the secrets of our universe. So those are the stories for you today. Let me know what you think about it. Should we continue this project or not? And whatever you think about it, please share your thoughts in the comments below. And regardless, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.